Hey, what's up, everyone? Tedrick85 here, and today I'm going to be talking about episode 11 of book 4 of The Legend of Korra, titled Kuvira's Gambit. This is the penultimate week before the series finale of Korra, and as expected, this turned out to be quite an explosive episode. Uh, in the intro of this episode, we get to see Kuvira speaking in front of her forces, with her intentions to take over Republic City, because uh, it's technically Earth Kingdom territory to her. And but with her saying this in front of her forces, she cites how Avatar Aang and Fire Lord Zuko stole the land and formed Republic City from it. After the speech, Kuvira and Bato Jr. have a tender moment together. Which I found rather interesting because it reminded me of when uh, Zaheer and Plea were together and they had their ten tender moment right before Korra surrendered herself to him and after he uh, ended up losing Plea in that anyway. But I just thought that they uh, found it interesting that uh, that parallel was drawn. At Republic City, they talk about the volunteer, uh, or should I say the uh, President Reiko and everybody talks about the volunteer evacuation of the city. The Bay Fongs and Julie come back and they talk about uh, the super weapon and Julie informs that Kuvira will use it on Republic City in two weeks. Julie explains how she spoke of uh, how she served under Kuvira as a double agent and that she never really bought into her philosophy and she felt it was the best way to get information from her. President Mako then makes the evacuation mandatory, and then Mako, and then he tells Mako to make the announcement ready. We get to see Varric seeing the constructions and the machines that we got to see prior that were based off the hummingbird butterflies, and uh, Bolin stops by and informs him of what happened between him and the Bay Fongs and that, and he also happens to have Jolie with him. Now this is the reunion. I I figure that most people were looking forward to the, um, between Varric and Jolie. And, uh, we get to see both of them, um, reconcile the differences. But, uh, jo only after Jolie demands that, uh, Varric treats her as his equal, not so much like a slave in that, uh, which, I do have to admit, you know, Varric is cool, but he is, he is a real jerk towards Jolie, and I really hope that, uh, after Jolie pretty much told him off that he gets to treat her a little bit better after this, uh, de depending on what happens after the series and that, so hopefully de this allows Varric to open up his eyes and really appreciate Jolie and who she is and what she's been able to do for him. Mako then makes the announcement of the mandatory evacuation to Republic City citizens, which doesn't turn out well because it leads to a bunch of confusion. Prince Wu then takes over, telling the citizens to not fear and that Republic City is a city full of winners who can get out of the city in an orderly fashion, safe and sound. This calms things down considerably, which Lin compliments him on his speech. And I really have to compliment him too, because the development that we've seen Prince Wu, it seems like from the, the clips episode on, you, really, you are really beginning to see where Wu is starting to take world issues seriously, and you really get to see where he can potentially be a great king to the Earth Kingdom. And I'm really happy to see that, because I, ha I had my doubts about this guy before. Of course, I've been vocal about it in his blog. But, uh, yeah, we're finally getting to see that Prince Wu may actually be a competent ruler after all, should he get that chance to rule uh, Earth Kingdom, and depending on what happens with Kuvira and that. Pema and her family are staying uh, in Republic City, and she tells Tenzin that uh, she and the family are going to do whatever it takes to help Republic City. Tenzin a tasks the kids with helping the other airbenders watch out c for Kavira's army. We then get a shot of Republic City evacuated with Kavira's army approaching. President Reiko is staying on Air Temple Island, where Korra informs him, Tenzin, and Lin that she and the crew were going to take out Kuvira's spirit weapon before it reaches Republic City. Despite Tenzin's objection to this idea, Korra explains that it is a risk worth taking, which President Raiko agrees. And we're going to see Korra once again building the confidence in that that she had in Book 3, where she felt comfortable trying to resolve issues in that. And that's something we really didn't see early on in this book, and 
And you can definitely tell, ever since she managed to cope with things after what happened with her and Zaheer and how Zaheer was able to help her reconnect spiritually and that, you can really sense that Cora is beginning to get her mojo back and she's ready to tackle this thing head on. Later on, we see Commander, I Commander Iroh's forces uh, making a startling discovery that Kuvira's forces are a week early and that the spirit weapon has been assimilated into a giant mechanical robot of sorts. Which, I'm not really surprised by this, and I don't think many people are either, considering that the episode after this is titled Day at the Colossus. And, uh, Colossus pretty much means like a giant statue or a robot, for those that don't know what that is, and, uh, which I'm sure most of you do, do so. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we get to see this giant mechanical robot in that, and we get to see the cannon of the spirit weapon on its right arm, and, uh, unfortunately for Iroh's forces, they end up getting obliterated by this thing as it shoots right at them, and where they're, um, keeping a watch out for Kavira's forces. Cora and the crew, uh, Cora and her crew, rather, fly on a sky base and where they see the giant robot. We see that Kavira is the one controlling the robot, and she tries to blast Cora and the crew out of the sky. They manage to uh, barely escape while Kuvira doesn't go after them, stating that nothing can stop her now. Cora then returns where she informs Tenzin that their intel was wrong and that Kuvira must have known that Julie had the information in regards to her plans. Tenzin informs Cora that they are not ready for an attack which President Raiko orders Commander Iroh and his forces to lock down Republic City. Asami asks to go, uh, for everyone to go to her factory where the metal suits she and Varric designed are, and that they need to get them ready, and Su Yin offers her help as well. We then see Prince Wu and Perma evacuating the rest of the citizens out of the city while Republic City forces and Kuvira's army are at a standoff. We then see Kuvira and the giant Colossus arrive, where she uses the spirit weapon on Republic City ships when President Raiko asks her to stand down. She then issues an ultimatum. Either President Raiko surrenders Republic City in three seconds, or she will wipe out his army. He reluctantly surrenders, which Kuvira then requests that he turns his army and the Avatar over and give Batara his location. Which shouldn't be a real surprise to anyone, considering how Kuvira was able to use her force in that to take over the... Earth Kingdom states at the beginning of this book, and uh, we get to see that uh, she is very much like Az Azula in the fact that she can manipulate, and she can she has an uncanny ability to get her way no matter what the situation is. And as long as it, as far as we see anyway, that she's getting her way again with uh, taking over Republic City. After hearing Raiko surrender Re uh, Republic City, Cora refuses to turn herself over while Iroh tells her to find a way to defeat the giant robot. She meets back up with the others at Asami's factory where she, where she tells him her idea of capturing Batar, since he's the only one that can stop Kuvira's robot. Cora, along with Tenzin, Bumi, Janora, and Kai, fly over to Batar's airship, where they succeed in capturing him without anyone noticing. They take him back to the factory and interrogate him. Cora threatens to get inf information from him by force. Then Sue tries to reason with him that what he's doing isn't going to make anything better. Finally, Cora realizes that the best way to get to him is by telling him that she will make it her life's mission, that he will never get to see Kuvira again as long as she continues her pursuit of Republic City. And I thought this was really cool. I thought this was a really cool moment. Because we finally get to see just how far Cora has gone since the beginning of this book. We get to see her development from this broken character that we saw from the book 3 finale. To someone that really gets the sense that she has the ability to control the situation. And we get to see how her idea of making Batar almost like a uh, bargaining chip for Kube try to reason with Kubera during this uh, tense moment. I find it quite admirable, to be quite frank, because this shows just how strong of a character Cora really is. That she's able to bounce back from set of, um, the trauma of her Zaheer battle. And being able to really take this thing head on, and uh, much like I said before, but uh, we're finally getting to see her truly act like the avatar that she was before her traumatic moment at the end of Book 3. 
Meanwhile, Bateau's airship arrives at Air Temple Island, where his guards are baffled that he isn't inside. President Raiko then suspects that Kuvira is playing games with him, but Kuvira says he should have been on. Korra lets him speak, where he tells Kuvira of the terms Korra presented to him. Kuvira then tells him that he's right, Republic City isn't worth sac sacrificing their lives together, and that she loves him. However, after learning where Batur and Katora are, she proceeds to use his spirit weapon anyways, much to Batur's surprise. Kuvira then proceeds to obliterate Asami and Beric's suits in the factory, while Ra Ra President Reiko watches the action with horror as he tasks Lin to search for any uh, survivors as we get to see Kuvira pretty much sigh. We get to see her sigh and then... At the end of the episode, we we can tell right off the bat she that she's gonna continue her plans to take over Republic City. And I gotta admit, you know, I think it's pretty hard for anybody to find any kind of sympathy towards Kavira, towards Kavira, especially after what she did there. That she was willing to risk her love to, for Batar, not only destroying the Avatar and her friends, but also taking over Republic City and. I know, for me personally, I think it's really hard for me to find anything favorable to look at Kavira anymore because we get to see just how mad she has become and how far she has fallen from being a metal clan guard that was uh, faithful to Sue in Book 3 and to, quite frankly, turning into this big monster in Book 4. And uh, she v she's definitely puts me in mind of... Uh, Fire Lord Ozai at the end of book 3 of, of the original series where he was willing to wipe out the entire Earth Kingdom in order to form a new empire from the ashes where he uh, becomes the Phoenix King and uh, we get to see the same thing here which uh, you get to see Kuvira early on in the episode even that she was she didn't bat an eye whatsoever destroying Iroh's forces or the ships or even Asami's factory so She's not going to bat an eye whatsoever to, that she destroys as much as she can in order to seize control of Republic City and stop the Avatar once and for all. And um, But yeah, we get to really see just how evil she is. And uh, this this whole situation here really sets up really nicely for the finale. It really should set up... Which, I was kind of hoping at the beginning of this book that this finale was going to be comparable to... Um, the one in Avatar Last Airbender, but I really don't want to get my hopes up, but the way the scenario is being played out, I think we're going to be in for a treat next week for the two-part finale. Because not only uh, do are we do we have to find out what Korra and her crew is going to do about the Colossus that Kavira is controlling, but we're also going to have to figure out exactly what their plans are regarding the stopping Kavira herself, because stopping the giant robot is just one step. It's actually bringing Kuvira's forces and Kuvira herself down. That's going to be a tall task for Korra and the, the, everybody that's left in Republic City. And, uh, you really... It's... I, 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 know, I know in the original series, we got to see Aang through, like, all... having to go through the Air Nomad genocide and that, and having to deal with Fire Nation and what they're going to do when Sozin's Comet arrives. And... For me, I get that same vibe when I get this because uh, the stakes are high like it was back then and uh, everything's, well, not most everything seems to be resting on Korra's shoulders since it's her re uh, responsibility as the Avatar to bring balance to the world much like Aang was contemplating with his past Avatars or what course of action to take against Fire Lord Ozai. So, um... But yeah, I, needless to say, I, I'm really, I'm really anticipating what happens in the the season finale, and I'm and I'm fairly confident that it's not going to disappoint. And uh, no matter what happens, I think it's going to be a very interesting, and it's going to be a a talk worthy finale to say the least, because uh, we got to see Korra uh, go from this naive kid that goes to Republic City because he's the Avatar to uh, overcoming a physical and mental trauma and uh, becoming this uh, confident Avatar again to try to tackle this, this, this thing head on to stop Kuvira and her forces for good once and for all in that. So, um, but yeah, that's 
pretty much it I really have to say about this episode. So thank you for watching this, and I will see you again next week for the finale.